What was Atlantis? Was it a place, a culture, and what happened to it? I'm Timothy Hogan, Grandmaster of the Knights Templar. And I'm Scott Walter, a forensic geologist and a Knights Templar. And this is Mysteries of the Knights Templar. So the question is, who were the medieval Knights Templar? And who are the Templars today? But more importantly than that, what is the connection between the Templars and Atlantis? And who better to ask that question than the Grand Master himself? Tim, who were the Knights Templar? History has suggested that it was an order founded in 1118, specifically to defend pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. This was during the Crusades, and uh, pilgrims needed protection in order to go there. But we know, in fact, this was actually a cover. The Templar Order was founded because there was a belief, there was a knowledge that there had been a pre-Diluvian civilization. The Bible referred to it as the time of Noah, and that it had collapsed during a massive cataclysm. Flood is, is how it's described in the Bible. Ultimately, these Templars, they needed to track down the pockets of survival of the knowledge, the technology, the philosophies that had been preserved from this pre-Diluvian civilization. So what I'm hearing you say is that Atlantis was not necessarily a place that sunk into the ocean. It was a high culture. Yeah, it was more like a worldwide network of information that was being preserved at different parts of the world. And when this cataclysm occurred, everything fell apart. It fell into disarray. And we went into a very dark period in humanity. But the Templars understood that if they were ever gonna bring Europe out of the Dark Ages, they needed to find the remnants of this lost civilization, the technology, the philosophy, and use it to spur people into a new high culture. Okay, let me ask you this. Is this a fair way to couch this, that the Crusades and the Templars' involvement in Crusades of capturing the Holy Land and establishing really what was a base of operations so that they could go throughout the region to round up some of this ancient knowledge, this ancient information? Is that pretty much the story? Yeah, while well, Crusaders were busy trying to fight for the Holy Land and uh, taking over territory, the Templars were more concerned with digging for artifacts. So what it sounds like to me is the Templars had a mission even before the Crusades. They knew this stuff was there. How did they get that information? Did it trickle down all the way from the time of Atlantis? Well. It did. You have to remember that the Templars largely came out of Albigensian families in southern France, which were a Gnostic sect. So they already had ideas that were contrary to the popular establishments of the time. You mean of the Roman Catholic Church? Roman Catholic Church and the monarchies. Right. They, they were very democratic and they were open to spiritual ideas in which the individual was empowered. Hmm. Uh, this allowed them to go out and try to seek out other communities that had these views. In particular, there was a tradition that caused the Templars to travel to Constantinople to meet with a group there that was known as the Brothers of the East. This particular group in Constantinople uh, had originally come from Greece, had been established in 1057. And they set themselves up in an area that was known as the, the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus, which was a building designed by an alchemist in which the Pythagorean and other ideas were incorporated into it, Gnostic ideas. Sacred geometry. Sacred geometry, absolutely. So Tim, there's a uh, pervasive rumor within the Templar tradition that I've heard for years. And I would like to get confirmation from you, the equilateral, equal armed cross that adorned the Templars' white tunics and that they're famous for, that's a very old symbol. Is it true that it goes back to the time of the Atlanteans? Yeah, in fact, 
It's a symbol that is found all throughout the ancient world. In particular, ancient Sumer. It was something that was utilized by what were known as the Anunnaki or the, or the gods of ancient Sumer. But you also find it in Egypt and other places. And it related specifically in, in ancient Sumer to a alchemical science that was known as Graal. G-R-A dot A-L. Which that is, sounds familiar. Yes, this, this came to be partially associated with what was later to be known as the Holy Grail. Right. Which the Templars were said to be guarded. So they adopted this symbol. So a lot of people are going to ask a question, how do these different traditions recognize each other? How do they know who's on their side and who's not? And I think that breaks down to signs of recognition, just like we have in our modern Templar order and within Freemasonry, correct? Correct, yeah. There were certain signs, there were certain handshakes that had been passed down from early times that these different Gnostic families and traditions had been holding on to. So when Hugh de Paines and Godfrey de Saint Omar had inherited these things, they went to Constantinople they were able to exchange them with the brothers of the East. In particular, there was a Joanite tradition under a guy by the name of Theoclete and another man by the name of Michael Silos, who was a very famous French philosopher. And they had been at Constantinople and they had the blueprints for what Hugh de Paines and Godfrey de Saint Omar needed to do to form the Templar order and specifically to go to Jerusalem for the next stage of their mission. There's documentation that has come to me over the last 15 years. It's called the Cremona document. And one part of it is a specific narrative that talks about Hugh de Payen, the first Grand Master of the Knights Templar, and five other knights who entered under the south wall and followed a tunnel system and found an ancient ritual chamber. How old it is is unknown, but inside that chamber they found, or I should probably say recovered, not discovered, artifacts that they knew were there. This included ancient scrolls, ancient knowledge, as you mentioned, technologies in the form of instrumentation, gold, wealth, and the remains of a very important person in Templarism going all the way back to the first century, John the Baptist. Is there a connection between John the Baptist and the Johnanite tradition? There is. In fact, uh, the entire Johannite tradition got its name specifically from John the Baptist, who is deemed to be the initiator of Jesus. And according to the Johannite tradition, he was meant to be the leader of this spiritual tradition. Unfortunately, he was taken out early. But the Johns of the Bible were all part of this tradition, and it's believed that there was a succession, a line of succession, going all the way up to Theoclete in Constantinople, uh -huh. who then, in turn, entrusted Hugh de Paines with this same mission. Okay. So... What you're saying is there's a tradition that starts with John the Baptist, comes forward all the way to Theoclis, right? Correct. How about going the other way? Does this go all the way back to Atlantis? It does. And this is where we, we go back to some of the Babylonian traditions that talk about the god Oannes, who came from the sea and baptized priest kings and gave them the keys to rebuild civilization it was deemed that these myths were probably alluding to the Atlanteans who had survived this cataclysm and had preserved pockets of information and technology. Mm -hmm. And it's worth pointing out that the word Oannes, the name Oannes, uh, whose feast day in the ancient world was June 24th, hmm. just Wait happened to become... <laughs> John the Baptist Day. It, that's exactly right. And John in Greek is Ioannis. So, so coincidence? It was a tradition. Exactly. It was information being passed down. The Templars recovered this. They began their archaeological digging for the first nine years that they were in Jerusalem. That's all they did was dig under the Temple Mount. And information that they got from there led them to other locations like mm. Egypt, mm -hmm. Lebanon, and other places 
ultimately to the new world of what was to become known as America. Right, right. Well, the evidence that we see is in the form of Templar graffiti carved all over the Middle East region. That's correct. They met with people like the Sabaeans mm -hmm. in northern Turkey who were preserving a whole tradition in the area that we now refer to as Gobleki Tepe, which had the seeds of civilization being, being preserved there, all the way down into Egypt in places like Abydos, where they were meeting with Coptic Christians, which was a different tradition. And then within Jerusalem itself, as they were digging out of the Temple Mount and other places, one of the things they came across, and this is from traditional Jewish sources, is they came across certain jars and as they opened up these jars, much like we find with the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Nadj Hammadi Library, mm -hmm. they discovered these new texts, which what we now know is were the Zohar, the, the texts known as the, the fundamental aspects of the Zohar. So this would have been the genesis of Jewish mysticism, the Zohar? Absolutely. Not only was it the genesis of Jewish mysticism, but there was information in the Zohar that pointed to land on the other side of the ocean. In fact, it talked about other continents and the earth being round and where people lived. And, and this was fundamental to the Templars in their discoveries of, of what there was to follow thereafter, including right. going to the New World. Okay. Just recently, some images were shared with me and some drone footage of a site that's two and a half miles away from Gobekli Tepe. And we've now coined the phrase for this site, Templar Tepe, because there are a couple of walls with Templar graffiti carvings that are undeniable, unmistakable, which tells us the tradition was there. The question is, what were they doing? Was it somehow connected to Gobekli Tepe? And I think the prevailing wisdom now is pretty much universal that Gobekli Tepe was an ancient observatory dating back to the time of the Atlanteans because you mentioned this catastrophic event that didn't completely destroy the culture, significantly reduced it almost down to nothing. And what we see at Gobekli Tepe is this incredible observatory was intentionally buried. Archaeologists are saying it was intentionally buried at the very same time of this catastrophic event that has now been labeled the Younger Dryas Impact Event. That's right. Well, and it just so happens that this Younger Dryas Impact Event, as it's being called now, falls exactly in line with the time frame of when Plato specifically said Atlantis collapsed. <laughs> and not only that, but we find remnants of that same story being preserved at Edfu in Egypt, talking about this great cataclysm and how long ago it was, and it falls in with that exact same time period. What we understand now as Templars was that as that civilization collapsed, the technology had to go into hiding had to be preserved in different areas. And certainly places like Lebanon and Egypt and Jerusalem became fertile places to preserve this stuff at that time. You know, one of the things that was found by the Templars was a series of arcs, which are now associated with Arcs of the Covenant. Wait a minute, a series of arcs? I thought the ark was just the ark, the one ark. ark. No, there were multiple arcs. In fact, some traditions say that there may be as many as 100. The Templar Order has found evidence of at least 10, but they recovered six. Mm -hmm. And they knew that these things couldn't fall into the hands of the power structures of the day, so they had to go into hiding. So there was a great effort on the part of the Templar Order to take these arcs and try to understand them, how they worked, and it turns out these arcs, what they really were was giant capacitors. They, mm. they could generate electricity and they were filled with a superconductive substance, which the Bible refers to as manna. Manna, that's right. And manna in Hebrew just means, what is it? And we know now it was probably named this because when you test this substance, it doesn't show up as anything. <laughs> like, you know, most tests are done with spectroscopic analysis 
or, infrared spectrometry, right, yeah, X-ray uh, diffraction. Back, right back then, they would do a burn test right. to see what color the flame was. But this didn't show up as anything. But it had these unusual properties, and since they couldn't tell what it was, what is it? Okay, here's the big question, though. You said. The mana was the power source, right? Yeah. And that these were capacitors, batteries. Yeah. What did they run? Thing that we think is it was probably broadcasted electricity throughout the planet from the old Atlantean tradition. They probably was a world grid network, electricity being broadcasted around the world. And when this cataclysm happened, it just shut that all off. So they were able to preserve the capacitors and that's about it. But the grid was shut down. The grid was shut down. And the Templars were, were wise enough to recognize, okay, this happened in antiquity. It could happen again. They had the mission of trying to rebuild civilization to where Atlantis was before, recognizing that civilization is fragile and it could fall apart. So they had to preserve the keys to rebuild civilization again and again. When civilization collapsed, there was an attempt to try to preserve what they could. Some of this not only included these arcs, but they also included instructions for government, democratic ideas, power of the individual, the connection of the individual to God, and that the source of who we really are is connected to the Creator, and that everybody through their own efforts could, could connect with that. Right. This was the basis of what empowered democracy originally. So really what you're talking about is something that we've all heard that resonates with all humans, that we are all born with inalienable rights. That's right. As humans, when right. we come into this world, that we all have a basic list of things that we are entitled to just being here, right? That's exactly right. And so the Templars tried to preserve that and establish that. There were maps of the old world. In fact, uh, many of these maps that the Templars were creating and the, that the Templars also inherited were later to become known as what Admiral Perry Reyes of Turkey, yep. or the Ottoman Empire at the time, right. was cataloging. And, and he even said, hey, he got these maps from earlier maps. Well, these were Templar maps that had been being preserved. You know, one of the things that's always fascinated me is the Perry Reis map. Mm. And there are things on that map that shouldn't be there. Yeah, he had cataloged things prior to Columbus, including Antarctica without ice, and also the entire South American area. And this seems to suggest information that had been preserved from a previous civilization. If you're talking about Antarctica being mapped without ice, you're talking a long time ago. Probably what happened was there was even a tradition from before Atlantis that was preserving this information. These are part of the cachet of things that the Templars discovered. Let me guess, Perry Reese, probably a Templar, huh? Well, he certainly came out of that tradition. You gotta remember, he was in Constantinople, right where the Brothers of the East were, right where the, the Templar Order was secretly founded. And this was the center of commerce at the time. It was the center of the world. And this is where information was being brought back to. You know, the other thing that's really interesting about the Templars, something I paid a lot of attention to and studied myself, are these round churches that were used for, well, I should call them chapels, right? Yes. And they were Observatory chapels. Yeah, <laughs> laboratory astronomical uh, chapels that actually were observatories that were mapping the heavens. And what we now know is that there's a system of churches on the island of Bornholm in Denmark in Europe that they have now figured out by using long range alignments in the heavens to be able to calculate the circumference of the earth. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but when you are a maritime culture and you're traveling on the ocean, one of the most important things you need to know is how far is it to my destination? That'll, that'll allow you to plan accordingly with food and water and people, and it's gonna give you a tremendous advantage over anyone else if you know how big the earth is and how far away things are. 
They also began to encounter a number of different cultures that most people in Europe at the time had, had never encountered. And these included groups like the Druze, the Tahid Muhudun. Mm -hmm. There were Islamic sects that were mystical in nature. Now we would refer to them as Sufi. Mm -hmm. There were Druid traditions. And there were traditions within Lebanon that were really inheritors of Phoenician traditions and, and Canaanite traditions. And in their associations with these groups and in their travels in Egypt, there was one thing that they found amongst them all that was secretly being passed down, and it was this science that we now refer to as alchemy. Alchemy, yeah. And we know now, uh, especially you find this in Egypt, at places like Abydos, uh, where the Templars set up headquarters. They also set up commanderies at Philae, at Dendera, at Edfu, and a number of different places in Egypt, but particularly at Abydos, and even at Luxor itself in Karnak, there are depictions of alchemical processes. Mm. And in particular, there's depictions of these arcs and there's depictions of the mana. That mana putting in there was the catalyst for the arc to work. And this mana had to be made alchemically when it was produced. So how do you make mana? What does it come from? Well, it, it comes from just about everything, but you have to be able to calcinate it down and then extract it out of the ashes. We're going to pour that ashy lye into this to filter. Make sure the pH is nice and high. I'm gonna add an acid to it, taking something from above 12 and, and we're dropping it down. As you can see, there's stuff starting to form. We're gonna do this eight times just to clean it. So it becomes this self-contained atom that it becomes completely captured and it doesn't bind with anything. And this was the mana. You could also convert certain platinum metals into mana, which we believe this is really what Moses was doing when he burned the golden calf into a white powder ah. and to feed to the wandering Hebrews. It but was an allegorical reference to the alchemical science that he was performing, but it had to be veiled. Absolutely, and we see this depiction on the Egyptian temple walls as well, of where the pharaoh was being fed these cakes that looked like uh, they were cone shapes. Mm. And uh, they, they're usually depicted right next to these ark boxes. And uh, they're, they're being fed to the pharaoh as, as this special food that kept him healthy, and that they were being stored in these arks, which generated the electricity. But let's go back for a second. I want to understand exactly how does mana work inside the ark to create this power cell? So what this mana is, it's platinum metals that are in a monoatomic state. Mm. So what that means is each atom doesn't bind with the other atoms. And it does this because it's in a high spin state, what's known as a high spin state. The two outer electrons and the atom enter into what's known as a Cooper pair. And when they do that, they go into this high spin state. They're completely captured by the nucleus of the atom and they don't bind with the other atoms like they normally would. When this happens, they enter into a superconductive state. Mm. And it just so happens that when you have a container full of mana, these monoatomic atoms, if you subject it to a very weak electrostatic or electromagnetic field. The spark, if you will. The spark, it, it ends up causing the container filled with mana to weigh less than the same container filled with nothing. So there's a anti-gravity effect that's a starting levitation to happen. A effect? levitation effect? A levitation effect. And this is the reason why the arcs the, in the Bible is guarded by the Levites from which we get the word Levitation yes. later on, and that two Levites could carry these arcs with rods, even though the amount of gold and acacia wood that was put into building these arcs would have caused the ark to weigh several tons. But two people could carry it as long as it had a charge and as long as this these monoatomic atoms, this, this mana was inside of it. Okay, so what you're saying is they basically had the ability with mana when it was supercharged to cause things to levitate. Could this be the secret 
to the massive megalithic blocks that we find all over the world that have been cut and placed and seemingly it is impossible that any humans with the technology that we thought they had in the distant past actually could have been moved this way? Yeah, we think so. In fact, it's even possible that they may have just taken one of these arcs, bound it to the stone, and then that helped to cause the weightlessness of the stone itself. So at that point, then they could move the stones any way they needed to. As the Templars started discovering these things and figuring how it, it worked, they realized this was a technology that it was godlike power. So they knew if these fell into the wrong hands, they could be abused. And so at this point, the Templars had a strong mission to move these arcs and these other artifacts out of the areas of Jerusalem, of Egypt and other areas, move them through Lebanon into places like Portugal, France, ultimately Scotland, and then from there, move it on over to the Americas, which they had, of course, by this point, had already been mapping and knew about. They knew all about it. Well, let's just talk about the elephant in the room to this whole plan that the Templars had, and that's the Roman Catholic Church, right? And it brings to mind their strategy was something analogous to keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. And I think really that's exactly what was going on, at least for the Templar leadership. And by aligning with the church and um, giving them the impression that they were on their side was what allowed them to have the freedom that they did to round this stuff up with the ultimate plan of bringing it to North America. And I agree with you, I think that's exactly what was going on. And the Templars would throw the church a bone. <laughs> Every once in a while, the Templars were responsible for starting to build the cathedrals right. for the church. But even on the cathedrals, they tried to carve and preserve this information, much like the Egyptians had done in earlier times. So even to this day, there's Pythagorean concepts, Gnostic concepts, alchemical information. You go to the front doors of Notre Dame Cathedral, for example, there's a series of plate medallions that show all the stages of the alchemical process. process yeah. Well, this is part of what the Templars were trying to preserve. They also brought over iconography. For example, the, the Templar headquarters at Philae in, in Egypt was the uh, Temple of Isis. And in this Temple of Isis, not only on the temple walls, but also on the altars, there were these black basalt statues of the goddess Isis nursing the young child Horus. Which is identical to images of Mother Mary nursing that's Jesus, a, That's right? exactly right. So the Templars brought that iconography over, they gave it a new facelift, <laughs> and to preserve the memory of it, they carved what were to become known as the Black Madonnas, mm -hmm. which were these same iconography but painted black, so they looked like the statues in Egypt, and placed them in the crypts under the cathedrals that they were building. So Tim, here's what I think we have. We go back to the time of the Younger Dryas period. Prior to that, we had a high culture that exists that preserved ancient knowledge just in case something happened. And I don't think it was just in case. I think they knew something catastrophic was coming. I think Gobekli Tepe being covered up is a powerful piece of evidence to support that. And so they preserved this information and the survivors of that catastrophe lived on. And eventually the tradition, the Templar tradition, starting around the year 1000 or just after, acquired this knowledge, knew that they had to form a Templar order that would go in and align with the Roman church, go into Jerusalem, round up the stuff that they needed, find that old hidden knowledge and information technology that was left by the Atlanteans, take that knowledge, use it, to acquire the strength, the power, to eventually bring it over to North America. Is that a decent synopsis? Not only that, but they wanted to reestablish the Atlantean tradition in order to recreate what had once been and had been lost, but now had been found. So really, Francis Bacon was the one who wrote the New Atlantis. 
He was a Templar, and that whole book that he wrote was specifically an outline to rebuild these technologies that had been discovered by the Templars. So Francis Bacon, he was in on the secret, wasn't he? He was, yeah. And so what that means is the United States of America is the new Atlantis. Absolutely. I'm Scott Wolter. And I'm Timothy Hogan. And thanks for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Knights Templar.